Thank you to Malaprops for having us. Um, it is such an honor and a privilege to be here. And I'm so excited to talk to you all um, about this book, Blind Man's Bluff, and, and have a conversation um, uh, tonight uh, with James, or JT, as, as some of us call him and know him. Um, uh, as Stephanie mentioned, I am Melissa. I'm coming to you from my new home office in Ohio, where I just moved to take this job at Kenyon. Uh, so it's still coming together. It's not, uh, it's not that um, snazzy yet, but um, I have some books in the background, a poster of Tomboy Land that um, came from my, my virtual book launch event a year ago. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so um, I suppose that um, I'll kick things off with I, I have so many questions for you, JT, and um, and the, the the first thing that I kind of want to talk about um, is uh, well, I, wait, actually, are we supposed to? We're we're coming to you first, shouldn't we? <laughs> we're going to talk to you first about the book. You're going to kick it off with some book description. Well, well, yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> I think we did this backward. <laughs> the the. Uh we're going to do our brief access check where I uh, yeah. awkwardly try and describe my face uh, yeah. and my background, which is uh, about as as boring as it gets. Uh, a white love seat in front of a white wall. Uh, and I am wearing, uh, in honor of both of us, uh, a prairie schooner t-shirt that you can't actually oh, see cool. because my giant noggin takes up the whole screen because my camera is very close. But um, uh, and I have two Malaprops t-shirts, uh, but only one of them uh, fits and it has long sleeves and it's too hot for that right now. But uh, you're looking at a Caucasian male of a certain age with brown hair and green eyes uh, and a blue t-shirt, slightly visible. And I'll throw it back to you, uh, Em, and, and I think we were going to just briefly say, yeah, Blind Man's Bluff is, is my debut memoir in Tomboyland was your debut creative nonfiction memoir and essays, essay collection, you could parse what, what it was. But the, um, I mean, we both, we both debuted. I just realized, wow, you launched it during the pandemic too. And here I am launching during the pandemic. Um, and our, our stories, it, I was, I was rereading parts of Tomboy Land today and, um, taking a lot more time than I should have because uh, it was hard to stop and put it down. But both our books are really about identity and, and resisting identity and the forces that shape identity and the forces that we reach for to try and understand identity. And, and other than that, I, I wanted to have you as a conversation partner because Tomboy Land is one of my favorite essay collections, um, not of last year, but like period. So um, I'll throw it back to you. Well, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there's so much that I feel like our books have in common. Um, absolutely. They're both about identity. Um, and, and so much, uh, they're both also so much about finding the words for, for mm. ourselves and our lives and, um, and, and those identities. And I, and I just wanted to kick off my question with this quote, that was one of the ones that I, I was telling you earlier that I both underlined and asterisked in my um, copy of the book. You can actually see that I did that, uh, those of you who can see, um, uh, that that means that that is like the, 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 the passage that will stick with me forever. Um, and it goes like this. For someone who's supposed to be good with words, you still can't find the right ones to tell strangers who you are and who you are not. And I just feel like so much of the book is about that search for those words, um, for the truth of who you are, um, of, of your identity. So much of this book, um, the title alludes to it, is about sort of the lies um, we tell ourselves, we tell others, whether it's lies of omission or um, stories that we tell and retell. And so much of this book felt to me like that act of searching for those words, um, an act of discovery of finding those words um, and, and saying them aloud. 
And so I just kind of wanted to ask about the process of, of writing this book. Did it feel like a discovery? Um, did it feel in part like you were searching for those words? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and obviously the book could not have, I couldn't have started writing the book if I hadn't achieved a level of self-acceptance that actually gave the book a narrative arc because otherwise it was just still mired in denial and there was no story there. So I, I emotionally had, had come to terms, but that is, as, as a fellow writer, you know, that's uh, the first step to actually finding the words. Uh, and it's, it's a lot more complicated to find words for describing emotions. Uh, and I think we both write about those awkward fraught teenage years and well beyond the teenage years where you have no idea how to um how to express emotions and you're you're looking for all kinds of sublimation whether it's music for me it was it was bowie and prince for you perhaps with with slight embarrassment uh you revealed a lincoln park uh, <laughs> oh man <laughs> but <laughs> but the um but, but we find different ways to to channel that emotion and obviously writing is a much more productive way to, to channel that and um uh the the was the act of writing blind man's bluff a discovery yeah yeah um and it wasn't like i didn't know what i was feeling by that point but um i think narrative finding the narrative um and and tone and sort of weighing the comedic possibilities in a lot of scenes alongside the um the heavier emotions allowed me to to navigate um the la finding the language and and labeling things um and and finding that comfort with the label of a blind or disabled um and yeah i mean i the the <laughs> I'll see your quotation from from Blind Man's Bluff and raise you a quotation from Tomboy Land that I bookmarked and double checked, um, which is perfectly in line with with uh, this this first question. Uh, there was a line, and I'll probably misremember, but I think I got it right. Uh, instead of and I think you're talking about the in the Midwest or your family or both, or you said instead of talking about our problems, we seek power over them, and. I wondered, was all the, and that was in, I think, Switch Hitter, uh, the, the chapter slash essay. Um, and you write about all the ways you didn't understand what you were feeling about trying to find, um, I mean, a lot of it was, was teenage anxiety, but it was, it was, especially it was depression. It was, it was not knowing uh, what your place was in the world in terms of, of gender and, and lots of things. But when you get to college, the way to sublimate that becomes uh, partying, drinking, um, and, and uh, promiscuity and, and all those things. And I, I was going to ask uh, if you saw that in retrospect as, as sort of a way of hiding or a way of, of maybe trying to disappear or escape uh, emotion. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it, I, I was thinking, I had a really similar thought as I was reading your book too about like about hiding and the ways we hide. And um, I'm always thinking about the, the stories we tell ourselves and, the, and the, the ways we try to define ourselves kind of when we're resisting those labels or we're yeah sort of not able to look at what is actually happening and, and um, to really look at ourselves. And definitely in that, I feel like everything I was doing in my 20s <laughs> was in, in a way hiding, you know, it's certainly my early 20s, my teenage years and early 20s. And it was, um, you know, a lot of different forms of, um, you know, destructive behavior, but it was also <laughs> the ways that I was like, um, really, I think still in this mindset of performing femininity, you know, when I was younger, yeah. I read about this a lot. When I was younger, I, I sort of went through this period where I was like highly 
um, feminizing myself and, um, and I was still kind of doing that in college. And I think like sex was a part of that too, um, trying to sort of use that as a way to feel some skewed semblance of power um, and not really understanding until later um, and really sort of finding my community and, and figuring out who I was, um, you know, where real power comes from. And so much of that is uh, feeling, um, you know, comfortable with yourself or at least as comfortable as we can get with ourselves and yeah. um, being honest with ourselves about who we are and what we want. Um, so, so yeah, um, a lot of hiding before yeah. sort of uh, facing um, truths about ourselves for sure. And I guess that kind of leads to the next question I wanted to ask you, because we talked about this a little bit before, but we both kind of describe our books as coming out, as a coming out, you know, mm -hmm. in, in many ways, these books are both um, a coming out. And, yeah. and so I guess I'm wondering if it feels like that to you now that your book has been out for two months, right? Yeah, almost, yeah. Almost, uh, almost two months. Does it feel like a coming out? It, it does. I mean, in, you know, I was already out as, as blind or disabled uh, to the people who knew me and I had been writing about it. I mean, the novel Academy Gothic came out in 2015 and that was the first time I was overtly writing uh, with a protagonist who was visually impaired and it, sh you know, he shared my visual impairment, not quite exactly, but it was also a, a plotted novel, a murder mystery crossed with an academic satire. And it wasn't until I was writing a couple of essays to sort of promote that book, which came out from a university press. And, and so it wasn't, you know, setting the world on fire. Uh, so I didn't have to answer a lot of questions. It was all uh, self-controlled. Um, but I did write autobiographically. I, I wrote, that was the first, first real essays that I had written since graduate school. And, and that was sort of the first big wave when, when people on Twitter, um, and I wasn't super active on Twitter, but I knew people, uh, and they're like, wow, I never knew. And, and I was like, I mean, I, I guess at that point I wasn't hiding it, but I also had no reason to bring it up. And I, guess in a way that omission was was still a, a bit of a, a closeting mm -hmm. um and I've, I've of course since you know written essays that that have come out before the memoir but now this is you know when you publish a book with with I mean our both our titles are pretty bold uh mm -hmm. in announcing what you're going to find inside and and what you're going to find in, in the author and um it it's it's liberating I don't I don't know if you find it liberating and we can talk about the the nuances uh because we both sort of straddle barriers because i i'm i I've, I've just got started using the word blind um because i it's it blind writers that i've i've befriended um are are very welcoming to just the comprehensive use of that word and it's it's a much easier shortcut as much as i detested it for decades or or a, a decade and a half uh, now I, I just embrace that as a, a, a quicker way to express this is this is what I am. This is the easiest way to explain my my worldview or lack thereof, uh, literally anyway. And um, but it's you know it's it's still uh, um, uh, let me just <laughs> I'm starting to ramble. Let me flip it to you because you you know straddling categories of of identity. Um, when you you're because I want to talk a little bit uh, put a pin in this as, as, as Rachel Maddow would say uh, and come back to it the the notion of coming out of the closet who is that for is that for other people or is that for us right. um, but before before we tackle that um, what what's it been like for you because your book's been out for a year and a month um, and one of the pieces in Tomboyland talks about the the weird stigma of, of bisexuality and and the um how you're you're both things and and to a lot of people you're neither mm -hmm. yeah I mean when when you were talking about your relationship to the word blind I mean and that came through it comes through in the book 
it really resonated um, for me because I think that I had a very similar relationship to the kinds of labels that, you know, I kind of knew that I fit into in terms of sexuality and gender, and, and I really resisted them for a long time and refused to, you know, was, was definitely the cliche, you know, I, I don't use labels, but, um, <laughs> uh, but then kind of figured out that words like <clears throat> bisexual, even if it's limited, um, or, you know, to some connotation sounds more binary than the meaning means to me, um, or the word queer, which can kind of, for me, encompass both sexuality and gender identity. Um, it just, I, I came around to the, to the words and started embracing them and, and, um, and that also helped me connect to people in the queer community because mm -hmm. then it's like, you know, I, I'm not hiding from this word. I'm not hiding from this identity anymore. Um, yeah, and, that's, go ahead. That's, that's, a, that's exactly how I feel is, is, uh, I mean, for, for many years, I felt like I was, I, I was justifying my aversion to the word blind because, well, I have limited sight, you know, and that word means a comprehensive sightlessness. But I was really just one of the stories that we tell ourselves. Uh, and it was, it was connected. I, I you know, re reading the, writing the book, I realized, no, that that was what I told myself or what I, what I'd like to believe was my aversion to it, but it was internalized shame that kept me from using that word. Mm -hmm. And now I've, I've detached myself from that. And I, I don't feel like, you know, there's, I, like you said, the, the word has its use, the label or labels have their use, um, be they an insufficient shortcut. I mean, one of the things your, your book does so masterfully is, is shows the failure of so many binaries and, and so many this or that, because even, even emotions, uh, like the, the, the gun essay, when you, when you start to unpack what you genuinely feel, you realize this isn't, this isn't a, this or that, uh, and, and, you know, blind sighted, uh, there's, there's that liminal plane in between um where i where i sort of am um right and there's that that not to linger too long on this question because i still have so many more and there's so, so many things to talk about but also this like the you know the part of that sort of feeling like oh well you know i have i have limited sight so you know i, I don't really want to call myself blind yeah or you know a, a kind of parallel to that, I feel like for me was sort of not, you know, and I still feel this way to some extent, like uh, that, you know, there are times when I'm like, oh, I can't use the word queer because I'm not queer enough because of my bisexuality, you know, yeah. dated men and I'm in a relationship with a man. And um, so feeling like you, you can't claim a word too, um, there's almost like this internal shame and it's imposter syndrome at the same time. <laughs> Which is a, a real double-edged sword there. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I would love to, uh, I mean, you said you wanted to put a pin in the closet. <laughs> go back yeah. to, I, have other, I have lots of other things I want to talk okay. about. Yeah, I mean, just a, a quick, I, it was just something I was thinking about walking uh, today with, with your book again and thinking, um, or maybe it was after we had, pose that that idea of coming out with our books um and I, I realized you know it wasn't for me I guess my answer to the question is it's not so much for other people as it is just an extension of of my own self-acceptance yeah yeah I feel the same I feel the same and it's true that for for my book people are certainly learning things about me that they didn't know um yeah yeah about sort of that although I do feel like in part it was I wrote my book in part to, to sort of um, communicate some things to some people I think that, you know, I hadn't yet. And, and, I, and I didn't quite realize that at the time, it wasn't like a goal, but I realized sort of after I had written it that it was an opportunity to sort of give myself to people in a, in a more full way um, and, and hopefully invite people to know me in a, in a, in a more whole way, so. Um, 
I didn't, I don't think I conceived of it as a coming out, but it kind of ended up being a coming out. <laughs> um, so another thing I think that our books have in common, and one thing that I really loved about your book, among many things that I loved about your book, is the way that you experiment with form and, um, and structure. And so notably in Blind Man's Bluff, um, there is some point of view shifting. So I'm getting crafty, and this is like the, the creative nonfiction teacher coming out, but I, I, I was actually just having this conversation with my students this week, and I, I love this conversation. But um, in the first chapter, it's told uh, in the you, using the you, um, the second, second person. And then, and then the rest, you know, a, a large chunk of the book is in the first person. Um, you're telling your story in the first person. And then there's this long chapter um, later on, which I think is titled The Incredible Shrinking World, um, which is a long chapter and a difficult chapter, I think, um, that kind of discusses, that goes into detail about a, a pretty hard time in your life um, when I think you were facing a lot of these challenges mostly alone. Um, and, and so that chapter was again in the you. And so I guess I, I kind of just want to talk about that on a geeky craft level. Um, <laughs> what, why, you know, what, what was it about that? What, why did you make that decision to tell those chapters in the you? Um, what does that create for you? What does it allow? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I could go on forever. <laughs> and I, 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 I see uh, Dina Rells, our, our mutual friend, uh, is uh, happy about this turn in the conversation. And hi, Dina. And, and Megan Galbraith is here. And she, uh, I'm sure, is <laughs> happy for craft talk. And I, I, I love the second person uh, that gets so, I don't know. I, sometimes I don't trust people who dismiss it or don't like it. It's, oh it's almost very I, yeah, it's it has its detractors, um, and I, I should I should give a shout out right up front to Mark Richard for House of Prayer number two, which was the first book I read. It's not the my first encounter with second person, but that was the first book where I was so jealous of the second person, and I was mm -hmm. like, I would love to try this someday. I wonder why it works here, and. I didn't start out writing the blind man's bluff in second person, of, of course. Um, and the book went through lots of structural upheavals. Um, so what's currently the first chapter or the first pages, you know, at various times were not at the front of the book. But um, so I didn't, I didn't set out in the first person, in, in, in the second person, but there was a shift at some point where it just, I started writing in the second person. And there were those three chapters where it just felt natural and necessary to mm -hmm. shift to the you. And I, I realized why I was doing it uh, after the first draft, uh, probably in ways during, and it was those three chapters when I felt most unmoored and, mm -hmm. and least certain about a sense of who I was. Uh, I felt like I was most um, vigorously twisting in the wind of, of confusion. Um, and the first one is, is chapter one after the short prologue where the vision is first starting to go. And the other one is the, the long, very lonely chapter, excuse me, called Incredible Shrinking World that you pointed out, which is, it's, it's, it's um, that chapter, uh, weirdly, uh, the second person I think allowed me to be funnier than the chapter might have otherwise been. Same mm -hmm. thing with the dating tips uh, mm -hmm. chapter, which is the last one that uses it. Um, okay. And I don't know, I, I, I find it lets me step outside myself um, mm -hmm. and, and see myself with a, a sort of comic objectivity, but it also allows me to, um, I don't know, it lets, it lets me call myself on, on the mistakes uh, in ways that, I mean, you could certainly do that in first person, but I don't know, the you um, has this edge to it that allowed me to see myself uh, from the outside in while I was writing. So same question to you, because I was noticing in Switch Hitter, you mm -hmm. go from first person to second person, and then there's even third person. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I'm writing down right now um, what you just said about seeing yourself from the outside in, because I feel like 100% that was, that was the, the, I don't actually know if it was the motivation, but I think that's what it allowed me to do. So I do switch in one essay, I switch from first to second to third, which my editor hated me for and was like, you can't do that. There's, there's some, there's some rule where we cannot do this. And I was like, we're doing this. Um, it was a fight, but uh, I guess I won um, for better or worse. <laughs> um, but definitely what, what, what both did is allowed me to look, look at, to look at myself from that sort of outside perspective. And specifically, um, I talk in that essay about the experience of um, dissociation, um, like depersonalization, which was a thing that I was experiencing a lot um, during this time in my life, which is a product of uh, depression and anxiety and a lot of other um, sort of mental illness stuff that was going on and um, and I and I wanted to try to create that feeling on the page of of actually sort of floating outside of yourself yeah yeah consciousness leaves your body and you sort of you know are kind of like watching your body uh, do something or or just doesn't seem like yourself and you seem very dis it, it feels like you're very disconnected from what's happening. Um, so I think that's what I was trying to do um, with both the second and third person. But I also kind of wanted to make it jarring. I wanted to create yeah. this weirdly jarring shift. Um, so the form was sort of serving the function in that way um, because it was dealing with these very kind of traumatic incidences. Incidents, wow. Um, and I, and I just kind of wanted to a reader to feel that. So hopefully that worked. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, you're, I'm glad that you, you won the <laughs> battle with your editor. Uh, one. I really had to fight. It was one of those <laughs> like digging my heels in. Um, but yeah. <laughs> and, and, and huge gratitude to my editor, Amy uh, at Norton, who never questioned my, my second person. Um, and there was there was a note from her um assistant who was giving me really really good notes and then there was this one note that said um that she noticed a couple of the chapters were in present tense and the whole shouldn't the whole book be in past tense and that was when i started to freak out and i i had to email <laughs> amy i was like oh my god is this is this from you is this from uh zarina is who is who is this coming from uh and i was <laughs> if you if you look closely, you'll see that the three second person chapters are also in present tense. Um, oh, right. And I sort of associate present tense also with this sense of stasis um, mm -hmm. and an an, an, uh, a sense of things being unresolved mm -hmm. um, in ways that the past tense, um, it feels more looking backy or insighty. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and the other two little sections, the the first, the prologue and the, the very short last chapter are also in present tense for that same reason. But mm -hmm. we're probably putting to sleep some of the people, but others are cheering um, us on with our craft talk, I'm sure. <laughs> had Dean and Megan for sure. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a love song to the second person. Um, there was one other craft thing that I wanted to talk about. Um, uh, well, actually, I have two, but I'm gonna I'm just gonna pick one for now, so we have time for audience Q and A. But um, one of the things I loved most about this book that I just like I thought was brilliant um, was so as we're sort of following your life um, in this book um, and following kind of the the main arc um, and this main conflict, um, we're also seeing you as a writer. And so um, you know, young James throughout the book is. A struggling fiction writer, um, and he's you know trying and trying and trying and and sort of hitting walls and and just not you know um, it's just not like going the way he wants it to go and he's struggling and 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 continuing to write and continuing continuing to fight against you know um, sort of stasis or rejection and things like that. Um, but one of the things you do is you use that sort of novel the novel that you're working on in this book as a 
at least the way I interpreted it, as um, a bit of a metaphor for your life. And when we get to toward the end of the book, I'm not going to give anything away for those who haven't read it, but um, you talk about revising the novel and mm. work of revision. And um, I'm actually going to read another quick passage because it was another favorite of mine. There's a, there's a section in the um, dating tips chapter um, uh, about, uh, um, it's called dating tips for those still in denial. Um, but there's one dating tip um, that is titled revise. Um, and I'm just, I'm just gonna read a, a, a short part of it. True revision you tell your writing students is more than correction. You might find yourself deleting entire pages, rewriting from a different point of view, changing past tense to present, overhauling your entire first draft upon discovering you hadn't known what you were trying to say until the last few paragraphs. Let's break down the word, you say, drawing a slash between re and vision. You're trying to see what you've written a second time, see it with fresh eyes as you haven't seen it before. I just underlined the crap out of that whole paragraph. <laughs> it's just a so beautiful and such a perfect metaphor for this work you're doing in this book. Um, I think of of re envisioning your life and and like re revising the story that you're telling about yourself. Um, and I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit or hear you talk a little bit about the use of writing in this book. Um, metaphorically or otherwise. Yeah, yeah, I, I just finished an essay, uh, which is an expansion of the really condensed story in the book of, of my high school English teacher um, teaching a story when I, the year I was adapting to vision loss and I asked her if she would look at a short story that I was, I was dictating short stories into my micro cassette recorder and my mom would type them up and I, you know, pretend they were assi assignments for school. And it was really the first thing I'd ever written that wasn't for school, but I was taking them to my, my high school English teacher for feedback. And um, I, I had no idea at the time that I was clearly trying to express something or, or just trying to find an outlet, uh, trying to push against the, the walls that were closing in on me. Um, as my vision continued to deteriorate a, a bit throughout that year. Um, and I, I'm I, I just finished this, this essay that expanded on that. And I was trying to, to ask myself, why um, was I going back when she would give me notes? I had never revised anything in my life. Uh, why was I revising these, these short stories at age 16 and 17? And, and I thought, you know, it, I think it felt good um, after doctors had told me what couldn't be fixed mm -hmm. to go fix something with just words, or at least seem to fix something with words. And I was, you know, I think writing was always part of that. And I think all of us writers, nonfiction or fiction, we're always stumbling into what we should be writing. And it's, it's never a quick journey I, for, for most of us anyway, it takes us a long time to figure out what story we're trying to tell either about ourselves or through fiction. And, and I, you know, it's, it's um, whatever you want to say about writing. Uh, it's easier to revise a novel or a memoir or an essay or a short story than it is to revise how we see ourselves. Really well said. Um, well, I want to make sure we have enough time for audience questions. It looks like maybe we have a few in there. Um, I, I, I guess I, I just have one quick question before we yeah, get to yeah. that I really wanted to make sure um, we hit, but um, just because we talked about this a little bit, but um, kind of the, the, the genre um, question of, of memoir and essay, but so many of the chapters in your book um, re read to me like standalone essays, like they could serve as standalone essays. Um, uh -huh. They really have kind of like a whole arc and a life of their own. And I'm just wondering how you sort of conceived of the structure of the book um, and how it came together. Yeah, yeah, I, I definitely set out 
I think because I started writing it as we write most of our stuff on, on spec, I did not have an agent. I had not sold the book on proposal. And so I was just thinking I probably should publish some of these pieces <laughs> in order to make this more attractive. Um, so that was probably the inspiration. Although I think as a, as a novelist uh, or a trained fiction writer, I'm, I'm most drawn to narrative arc. Um, rereading Tomboy Land, I, I was in awe of how seamlessly you find tension, um, not necessarily from a narrative arc or how narrative arc is so creatively defined. Uh, and I was, you know, thinking, all I really know is, is the one way of doing it. <laughs> uh, I mean, I've got little tricks of braiding this and braiding that, but, you know, I still feel like I'm, I'm relying on a lot of uh, fiction skills at the heart of it. Um, so I don't know that I, I found, um, I, I guess there's maybe three chapters that I didn't conceive of as standalone essays. Um, and it, part of it was just because there was so much that I had to convey. I think it was the incredible shrinking world chapter and the one before it, uh, that was almost all in college. Um, and I guess the, the marriage chapters, uh, in retrospect, those, those feel more standalone than they, they were originally. Um, but that was, that was, yeah, you're right. I, I did set out for them to be um, essay-ish, uh, much to the chagrin of one of the early agents I queried who said she couldn't sell an essay collection. So uh, <laughs> kudos to you for selling an essay collection and boldly putting the word on the cover. <laughs> I definitely heard a lot of no. <laughs> so, um, great. Well, um, should we go ahead and open it up to audience? Yeah. Any questions? Hi. Uh, yes, we do have. Um, we actually just got another question from Megan Galbraith. Um, so I want to give a verbal shout out to Megan as well. Uh, Megan is the author of The Guild of the Infant Savior. Um, we had the pleasure of. of hosting um, Megan for an event a little bit ago and it was delightful and Megan um, called me a doll in the chat for posting the link and I just need to say how loud out loud um, how uh, perfect I think that is considering the dolls <laughs> and, her, <laughs> and the dollhouse uh, art project and um, and the dollhouses we got to see so um, uh, thank you Megan and thank you for this question um, You've both written deeply personal books. Can you talk about the response from people close to you versus everyday readers? Um, Megan says, writing memoir is hard this way and I'm very interested to hear how you both dealt with the experience. Yeah, we talked about this a little bit on the phone. Um, though I think we, everyday readers, we were sort of lamenting um, people who publish uh, quote unquote reviews at various outlets we won't name. Um, and most of the overwhelming people are, are, are kind and especially in, you know, I've only had two in-person events so I haven't gotten to interact with people on the level um, that I might have otherwise. Um, I, to me, it's been extremely gratifying. I just today, I've gotten four people who I'm not close to, but people who I, I guess I know from social media, uh, you know, sort of social media friends, people who I guess when we meet in real life, they'll be real life friends. But I mean, I, I have plenty of social media friends that I, I do. I mean, I'm Megan and Dina, I, I consider very, very good friends, though we have not gotten a chance to, to hang out in like, you know, proximity. Uh, thanks, pandemic. But um, the... Uh, um, yeah, I, 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 I've just been the recipient of tons of kindness at this point. Uh, so this maybe is a better question for you, Em, because your book's been out for 13 months. Um, but I, I, I will start out by saying that on the coolest, uh, tweet, one of my favorites was on Father's Day. Uh, Melissa tweeted that her dad had read her book m several times over. And I yeah. thought, especially, I mean, that's warm 
warm hearted and and like melts my soul in all the best ways, period. But when you consider the sensitive subject matter of this book uh, and the depth of it, that's even more impressive. So yeah, but Bob, I'll let you take the rest of that question. Bob Falavino has read Tomboyland four times and he recently <laughs> said to me, I think it might be time for a book read. Um, he is a number one fan. And um, yeah, I mean, it's been a, it's been a wild ride. Um, far and away the the responses to to my book have been very 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 positive and um, from reviews thankfully to all of the messages I'm getting and I know that a lot of people who write personal um, essays and memoir do not have this experience um, or have a lot of the bad version of the experience but I have yeah. not any you know bad emails or you know or, or hate mail or any of that um, I have gotten so many messages from strangers from the internet, um, sending, sending emails through my website just to say thank you. Yeah. Um, and to say that, you know, how much the book resonated. Um, and then, you know, people from my past, like you were saying, JT, like high school friends, um, people I haven't spoken to in 20 years, writing me to say, you know, how much the book resonated and, and, and how much it meant to see sort of what they felt like was also their lives sort of um, rendered on the page and people who are struggling with identity stuff saying that I put words, you know, that, you know, articulated things that they haven't um, been able to articulate. And that to me is like, the, that's it, <laughs> you know, like that, yeah. that's just worth yeah. it. it. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I've had uh, a couple of like conversation, like actual telephone conversations with, with otherwise strangers who, who would, we're going through vision loss uh, and told me how much the book meant to them just as sort of a, a as a guidepost uh, for what they were going through emotionally. And, you know, it doesn't, it really doesn't get any better than that. And you have yeah. to keep reminding yourself of that Yeah, and because it, it, we're neurotic writers. Exactly. And it, <laughs> it really does make up for the bad ones. Like, you know, whatever stupid one-star reviews we get on the sites that shall not be named, um, or like the, or the very, very few, you know, personal interactions I've had that have not been great, you know, the, the good outweighs the bad and you have to just sort of focus on that and, yeah. and try not to think about the, the negative responses because people who are responding negatively are just bringing their own shit, excuse, pardon my language, to the, <laughs> yeah. to the conversation, you know, it's not about you or your book, it's about them and easier said than done, like, you know, in exactly. The yeah um yeah the good outweighs the bad for sure um dina actually had a had a question that's similar but a bit different so i so i want to read this out and I, i'd like to say first um that uh bob falavino has some fans in the audience um <laughs> so uh apparently bob oh. falavino is out there just charming yeah. folks uh, okay. so hi bob um <laughs> And uh, Dina is asking, how and when did you show pages to family or close friends who may have had a complex reaction to some of their relevations and uh, relevations, revelations and content in your memoirs? Was it during drafting, revision, finished manuscripts? Did you, I'm throwing, this is me ad libbing. Did you tell them to just go buy a copy? You know, what was the, <laughs> what was, how did you sort of open that up to folks who were, who would really be poised to, you know, have, have a reaction? Um, I showed, I only showed, I think my parts of my book to, there's one chapter, one essay that um, is like very much about a former partner of mine. And it's, <laughs> uh, this is the essay that deals in, in like BDSM and, um, kink and stuff like that. So I showed that to him and asked specifically, like, are you cool with this? Is there anything you don't want in here? And he, he's also a writer. So he was like, A, he just loved it that we were, that I was writing about it. And, and B, just, there were like two things that he was like, yeah, if maybe you could like scratch those details, that would be great. Um, and then my partner probably read most of this book before it came out. Um, but other than that, I don't think I showed it 
to anyone else other than sort of writing group friends um, and other trusted readers, but not, you know, family. I don't think any of my family read um, most of it. Although some of the some of the essays were kind of previously published in in um, original form, or previous forms. So I guess they read those. Yeah, my uh, Lori, my wife is is. Uh... Uh, always an early reader of, of my work and she she was very uh, happy with the parts that she was in because um, of course she comes off as as very uh, wonderful which is which is true um, but in terms of other people people who might <laughs> I did not do the Mary Carr thing of or at least what Mary Carr purports to do uh, which is showing everybody who's in the book uh, a version of the book before it comes out um, mm -hmm. My, my rule was basically, um, uh, if I'm still in contact with you, you, you probably have no problem with how you're portrayed and you get to keep your name. Otherwise, I'll change your name <laughs> or, or identifying characteristics. And uh, you get to be one of the unnamed people referred to in the legally approved author's note at the beginning of the book. Um, and and uh, I mean, I, that's also one of the things that my, my agent was very helpful with before we even start, sent the manuscript out is there were a few passages where, you know, it's like, could you be a little more um, softer or kinder in this section or, um, you know what I mean? Just, just um, I, it, th that was definitely one of the, um, the late draft additions or amendments was, was um and it, it i i'm totally happy with what it is now but i can definitely see um a few drafts back how there was a misstep on how somebody was not given the full range of of me inhabiting their um mm -hmm. situation or life and mm -hmm. and as a result maybe they it maybe it came across as uh um you never want anybody to be um uh you, you know, I don't think you ever want to portray anybody in a way that feels like a hit job. Right. Um, but you also don't want to lie about how, how people behaved or, or people were. But that line from, from Hubert Selby is, uh, if you're writing about people you hate, do it with great love. Mm -hmm. I was just having that conversation with my writing students today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and if I were the age of our students, that would be really hard to uh, embrace, even yeah. if it were not that hard to understand. It's a tough pill to swallow for a young writer and for not so young writers. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So it looks like that's the last question that we had. You actually um, answered Heather's question earlier, just in the course of your conversation about point of view and the, and the, and the second person. Um, because uh, that came early on and you, um, and I don't, I, I don't think you were looking at the chat. I think that was, you know, that just evolved from your conversation. Um, and I just want to add my thanks and I'm going to go ahead and, and shout out to Patricia, who I know loves this as well. We love the process conversations also. I know there are writers in the chat who are, you know, uh, all here for the process conversation. Um, that's also me and Patricia. And, um, and we do know that some people are not all about, <laughs> all about that. And you very skillfully mixed it up. But, um, but yeah, we could, we would be down for 90 minutes of that if, you know, <laughs> if y'all ever want to come back and do that. Um, that's great to hear. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so it was a wonderful conversation. I, um, I'm not a writer, so I don't have better words for that. Um, but I've just uh -huh. so enjoyed listening to the two of you uh, this evening. Um, it's just, it's just been, uh, first of all, you're both just really warm people and easy to be around even virtually. And, and second of all, you've, you've just dropped some wonderful writing wisdom. Um, and, uh, and so I really enjoyed being able to spend this time with you. Um, and I think the folks who've been with us here, uh, I feel safe in saying they have as well. So um, I appreciate you so much. Um, and I messed up, uh, still managed to mess up the order of the intros in the beginning. So I'm just gonna throw that out there. That awkwardness, all on me, y'all. I remembered something that we talked about earlier and forgot 
the last thing we said. So anyway, all human all the time. <laughs> it's, it's Thank you so much, Stephanie, for having us. And I, I said this on social media and I, it, it is the absolute truth. You guys are one of my favorite bookstores in Asheville. We, well, when, when travel is a little more uh, regular, uh, my wife and I are in Asheville usually a couple times a year and Malaprops is, is uh, always, we're usually in there two or three times during the weekend mm. <laughs> coming to in-person events and then skipping across the street to the chocolate fetish. There you go. That's a, that's a common, it's, they just repaved the uh, street right out front, Haywood, or you'd probably see that groove in the asphalt, right? <laughs> that particular uh, back and forth, I think happens pretty often. Thank you so much, JT. 